So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the lead engineer on the Ansible core team uh, on the open source project. So uh, that's kind of a recent thing. I've been with Ansible for uh, almost four years now and uh, the Red Hat acquisition about three years ago. So uh, life's been interesting, but uh, it's, it's been nice to have the, the funding to, to kind of grow the project and, and make it a bigger thing. Um, there, I do have a little secret though. I love Windows. <laughs> I work for Red Hat, but I made most of my career as, as a Windows software engineer. Um, I, you know, I was working with C Sharp during uh, 1.0 beta 2 and like ran it all the way through. Uh, so I, I, I really love Windows. Maybe not as much as these guys, but uh, I, Windows has been putting food on my table for a really long time. So uh, my, uh, my kind of start with the Ansible project was, uh, was uh, building and expanding the, the Windows support. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about that today and, and what it looks like. So one more quick question. How many of you guys know this movie? OK. So if you don't, uh, this is like 90s teeny bopper remake of uh, uh, Shakespeare's Taming, with the, Taming of the Shrew. Um, our hero, Patrick, gets paid to take out the man-hating cat uh, just because, uh, by someone else that wants to date her sister. Her sister's not allowed to go out on dates until cat does. And, uh, Cat hates Patrick at the beginning of the movie, but through, throughout the movie, she, uh, she kind of, her feelings for him starts to grow. And at the end of the movie, she reads him a poem that, that describes how her feelings have changed. And uh, at, the end of this, uh, at the end of this talk, I'll have my own version of that poem for you guys. So um, this is actually kind of a twist on a talk that I usually end up giving to rooms full of Linux, uh, uh, Linux DevOps engineers and things. So, uh, I had to kind of put a little few twists on it because usually people are like, oh, I already know how to use Ansible, but I need to know how to do Windows things with it. Uh, can I get a show of hands? How, and how many of you have ever touched Ansible? Well, that's actually more than I expected, so that's cool. But for those of you that haven't, we'll just do a real quick overview of what Ansible is. Uh, it's simple agentless orchestration. So unlike some of the other things that are out there, um, Ansible pretty much runs exclusively agentless. So there's no footprint on the, on the managed targets at all. So we use what, you know, in order to do that, it's, it's push mode kind of by, by definition, but also we use whatever the target native management technologies are. So Ansible started out on Linux uh, and, and POSIX y kinds of things. So that, was, that meant SSH. Um, but as we expanded to Windows, as we expanded networking devices, as we expanded other things, we had to put in um, we had to put in a pluggable transport layer so we could talk to other things. So one of the first things to take advantage of that pluggable transport layer was our Windows support. Um, the native management technology on Windows is not Python, which is what um, Ansible itself is written in. So uh, you know we had to make a choice there, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, it is the, the core Ansible product, the thing that, and, and the, the open source project that I spend most of my time working on is a free open source command line project, and uh, we, we call it Batteries Included. So uh, with the current release that just went out a few days ago, I think we're at about 2,100 different modules, so that's 2,100 different kinds of resources that you can manage with Ansible just with what's in the box. You can also write your own. There's a lot of community stuff that hasn't made it into the box yet. Um, there's also, um, in addition to the command line thing, which is kind of where the rubber meets the road, there's also a web UI and a service scheduling and you know, a RBAC layer that sits on top of it that's a commercial product. There's also, it's also been fairly recently open sourced, so there's an open source version of that thing. The, the commercial thing is called Tower, and the open source project that backs it is called AWX. So if you see those out there, that's what those are for. Um, something, again, I'm, I'm sorry to say to a room full of Windows folks is that the controller is Linux-y for now. So you, you can run it on a Mac, you can run it on, on a Linux machine, you can run it under Wizzle. Um, so if you have Windows 10 or if you have one of the server builds that has Wizzle in it, you can do that. Uh, it does not work under Sigwin, and it, well, it might work under Sigwin, but don't do it. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you why if you really want to know. But, um, and it, doesn't, uh, it, it is not a native Windows application yet. And that's something that uh, I've been crusading for. And, and as the fairly recently uh, installed uh, lead on the Ansible project, maybe I have a little more leverage to get that done now. So I I'm trying, and I I'm, I'm doing what I can do. But I do work for Red Hat. So you know, it's, it's, kind of, it's a little bit of an uphill battle to get a native Windows version of the Ansible controller. But I'm working on it. Um, anyway, Ansible can talk to just about anything. So just really quick, we'll go over some of the basics of Ans Ansible. So, Inventory is kind of our first building block. It's like, what are the machines we're going to talk to, and how do we talk to them? There's a few different ways we can do inventory. The, the typical way that people start with it is static. You know, it's a static inventory. It's just basically a host file with some, you know, some uh, like, what, what are these things? And you can, you can slice and dice things up into groups and target things. So these are my web servers. These are my production DB servers. These are my 
these are my dev, you know, people can slice, those, slice and dice those groups up any way they want. It's definitely static is the simple way to go. Uh, dynamic inventory, when you're talking to a cloud provider or something like that, you want to go, I don't know what's out there, like go tell me everything that's in this Azure resource group or go tell me everything that's tagged like this. So uh, the dynamic inventory system in Ansible is very extensible. We ship a number of things that can talk to all sorts of different cloud providers, hypervisors, things like that. Um, but it's very extensible and easy to build your own things to talk to pretty much anything. Um, you know, just as a proof of concept, I wrote one that, that talked to an Excel spreadsheet. Like, you can do just about anything, not that it's a good idea. Um, and then Ansible can, inventories are also composable. So you can take the best of both worlds. You can take some static inventory stuff that says, I want to do things with groups this way, but then you can assign those groups and the, get things populating those groups dynamically from, from you. The, so those things can kind of stick together. And we'll see examples of all this stuff. We're going to build one of these from scratch. So we'll, we'll start from scratch. Like, I'm going to install Ansible. I'm going to show you how you would do that. It should work exactly the same way under Wizzle. I'm, I'm running Fedora today. But um, the next uh, kind of building block for Ansible that you need to know about are modules. Again, this is kind of like, this is where uh, the heavy lifting occurs. It's a unit of code that executes on a target, on a remote target, usually. Um, and it, it kind of samples and enforces the desired state on a particular resource. So if you're familiar with PowerShell DSC, it's kind of analogous to a DSC resource. Now, one of the things that's very different about Ansible from, from some of the other products that do this is that we don't store state anywhere. Like, the resource being managed is the state. So our modules actually have to go out and sample the state to see, like, what is it, what is it in right now? There's, there's pluses and minuses to that. Sometimes it takes a little longer to do it that way, but that also means that you know, the source of truth is the thing that you're managing, which is a really, a really nice benefit. Um, modules are properly written modules, and pretty much anything that we ship in the box is, is idempotent, so it means it's like repeatable, and it's only gonna do work when it needs to do work. So when the, when the resource is already in the desired state, the module senses that, detects it, and says, okay, nothing to do. And the other thing is that the module code on the remote target is ephemeral. So we leave no footprint, we leave no trace. The module code gets pushed over, it executes, it disappears. It usually never hits the disk. Like we do it all, we like fire hose it right into a PowerShell interpreter. So playbooks are the next thing that kind of builds on top of that. So a playbook is a, is a YAML document that is a series of declarative tasks. And those, are, those tasks are usually driving Ansible modules against your inventory hosts. So the play will target one or more inventory groups or individual hosts, and we'll have kind of a linear list of targets, uh, of, uh, of tasks that we want to execute. Um, it has embedded Jinja2 templating. Uh, so again, Python infrastructure, uh, Jinja2 is the, kind of the de facto best templating language available, so that's what we use. And um, as far as parallelism goes, so we do kind of uh, task linear, but host parallel um, uh, parallelization. So like uh, if I have 50 web servers that I want to apply the same configuration to, I can hit all 50 of those web servers at once if I want to, or I can do rolling deployments, or we can, there's, there's a lot of flexibility there in what we can do. But the, the thing that makes Ansible a little different from some other things that are pull-based is that the whole thing is task linear by default. So if I have a linear list of tasks that's like install this package, talk to this load balancer, take this thing out of the rotation, do this, do that, do this, it makes the orchestration kind of thing a whole lot easier because you can really easily reason about the state of the system as a whole, like what's, go what's going on right now. I don't have to worry about, there's not a lot of, of asynchrony and, and weirdness going on by default. Now, if you need those things for performance, they're there, but you have to opt into them. By default, we're gonna do everything in a very linear fashion, and we're just gonna execute that list of tasks just as you've put it in the playbook. It also makes error recovery a little bit easier. Um, because if something fails on one of these things, because of the item potence and some of the other things, you just, you know, you can control C the thing, just run it again, it'll go and say like, oh, nothing to do, nothing to do, it'll just kind of pick up right where it left off once we get to a point where there's still changes that need to be made. Last Ansible basic thing that we're gonna talk about today is roles. Um, so roles are really just kind of a way to package tasks from playbooks. Um, it's a place where we can de declare a set of default configuration or like variables, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna add knobs in something. Uh, that you can turn or that someone else that's using your Ansible content uh, can turn, then we package those things up in a role. It's just kind of an easy reuse and distribution format. And we have an online community called Galaxy where people can upload roles and, and put things around and share them and do things like that. So we're gonna take a look at all those things in a little bit. 
But let's get on to the 10 things that I'm gonna talk about today that, that people kinda of hate about automating Windows. So the first one is WinRM. Uh, anybody who's ever dealt with the underlying protocol knows that it's, a, it's kind of a hairy beast of 2000s era XML HTTP fun. Uh, if you never have to look at WinRM, that's probably a good thing. It's, it's, uh, it's not a very nice protocol to work with. But it gets the job done and it's in the box. So that, that makes it a really good candidate for us to use. Um, it has a, it's a non-interactive logon by default. So that kind of causes some problems when you need to do things like Windows updates that expect interactive logon, you, when you need to do a SQL Server install or something else that's using DP API or some of these other things that, that expect an interactive logon. So Ansible has ways of working around that where we can, we can become system and simulate an interactive logon inside the WinRM session. Um, but WinRM itself is, is kind of limiting in that respect. And a lot of people ask us about what's going on with Microsoft's OpenSSH server. Like, you know, since Ansible kind of speaks SSH natively, can we talk to Windows over OpenSSH using Microsoft's new server? And the answer is yes, it's coming. So uh, that kind of solves some really nice problems for us too, like uh, the, the big one being uh, key-based authentication, because if you've ever had to use certificate authentication in WinRM, you know it's not particularly useful. So we're really excited about uh, what's going on with uh, Microsoft OpenSSH. We've been working with, uh, working with them a bit and trying to get some bugs fixed, and, and they've been very responsive with us. So um, we have a proof of concept that's working, and uh, hopefully in this next release of Ansible that's coming out uh, around the beginning of the year, we will actually have official support for it. So with that, let's, tar let's start by installing Ansible, and then we're gonna, we're gonna create an inventory from scratch that'll target a Windows machine that I've got sitting here, and then we'll just see what it takes to do WinRM connectivity with that. So uh, I'm, do, I'm doing this on Fedora, but you know, it just kind of depends on what your distro is. But if you, go to our, if you go to the Ansible Getting Started page, like, it'll tell you how to install it for whatever distribution you happen to run. Um, so you know, if you're doing that under Wizzle, it kind of defaults to, to Ubuntu, but uh, there's lots of ways to do this. So there's two things I need to install. I need to install Ansible itself, and then uh, Ansible ships with uh, the WinRM connection plugin, but it needs the underlying Python library to support it. So in my distro, that's called Python 2 WinRM. So now we'll see how fast the internet connection is here. <clears throat> okay, yes, I want to install all that stuff. So yeah, again, there's lots of lots of different ways that you can do this. Uh, if you're using, uh, you know, if if you've got a, if you've already got a Python environment set up, you can use pip. Um, that's that's actually probably the best way to get the most up to date. If you want to be kind of on the bleeding edge of whatever Ansible's doing, pip is the best way to do it because the the OS package managers kind of vary in how frequently they update their Ansible stuff. Um, if you're on Ubuntu, also we have um, a package. We have a uh, um, we have a private package repository that gives you whatever our latest shipped version is as opposed to whatever the uh, Ubuntu maintainers got around to packaging. So looks like we are just about done here. Okay, cool. So with that, now Ansible's installed. So the, the, what I want to show you is just how quick and easy it is to get started with Ansible. Because it's a command line tool, unlike some other things, like there's no server to set up, there's not a lot of stuff to go on. It's just like install Ansible, create an inventory, go talk to hosts and do stuff. Um, so it's very easy to get started. Um, so let's just create one. We're going, to create a, uh, we're going to create a file called hosts in the current directory. And I happen to know that my uh, Windows uh, IP is 192.168.33.71. Now, if I were on a Linux machine, that's kind of all I need to do, because Ansible speaks SSH by default, and, and just if I were using like keys, if I had all that stuff all set up already, this is all my inventory has to be. It's like, what's the host? Um, and now you can list as many hosts as you want in here, and remember, you can talk to those things in parallel and do all sorts of uh, you know, crazy parallel stuff if you want to, but in our case, we're just going to be talking to one. So we're gonna create a group here called win. We're gonna just put that in a group and then we'll set some variables on that that tell it, because we need to tell it some other things. Because it's a Windows host, we need to say like, okay, we need to, we need to speak WinRM, we need to do some other things. So we're gonna set some variables. 
So we're going to create a section. This is an INI format file, if you hadn't figured that out already. You can also do this with YAML. We have a YAML inventory format as well. So if you're familiar with that, if you like it, you can do it whichever way you want. So the first thing we're going to do is something that's very insecure, and this is demo where only. I'm going to set my username and password in plain text. Please don't do this. Um, there's lots of ways that we can do this. We can prompt you for the username or password. If you're using Tower, we can, we can store those securely in the database, encrypt it, and use them. And you can, you can kind of delegate the usage of your credentials to other people on specific jobs. Or you know, there's lots of ways you can kind of slice and dice that stuff. Uh, we also ship something in the open source core product called Ansible Vault that allows you to do secure in-place encryption of these, of these uh, values. So please don't do it this way, but just for the purposes of our demo. Um, the other thing we need to do, we need to tell it we're not speaking SSH, we are speaking WinRM. And then the last thing we need to do is tell it, now, so if, you, if you're using a fairly recent version of Windows, uh, a lot of times, the, uh, um, a lot of times the, the PowerShell remoting stuff is already turned on. WinRM has been kind of quick configured for local subnet access. So sometimes you can just get away with talking to that directly without having to do any remote configuration on the Windows machine at all. Um, in other cases, there are, there are things, you know, if you, if you want to have, the way we used to always work was with a self-signed, we would expect that you had a self-signed HTTPS uh, listener on there or that you had actually deployed a certificate. Um, so the default stuff for Ansible when it's talking to WinRM is, uh, is that, is to use SSL. Now, SSL, like, we need to tell Python, like, don't try to validate the, the, the certificate on there because it's, it's self-signed and it's going to fail. Ansible wants to do that by default, so we need to tell it, like, if you're speaking SS, if you're, if you're going to do HTTPS, don't try to validate it. So we'll say WinRM uh, server cert validation ignore. So that's, that's it. Now, we can add as many other Windows hosts in here as we want. If we put them all in that Windows group, then they're all going to inherit those settings. So we only have to set all this stuff up once. Now, let's see if I've done this right. So there's two different entry points into Ansible. There's one just called, the one that's called Ansible is just run an ad hoc, basically like run a module against a set of targets. And so it's really nice for like ad hoc commands if you want to go out and see like, um, you know, is this patch installed on these 50 machines? You can just do it right there on the command line. It's a single shot, run a module. So we're going to do that first, just to make sure that everything's cool. So we're going to target the win group that we just created. Um, actually, hold on. Let me check one thing here. Let's go pop up my 2016 machine. Now, I mentioned that, like, if you know, depending on what you want to do to set up WinRM, there's lots of different ways that you can do it. You can do WinRM quick config, and we can do the message encryption now under the covers to do all the things that, that we need to do to talk to that without setting up a self signed cert. But uh, if we don't do it that way, um, we also provide a script that does the creation of the. Um, I'll go ahead and make this a little bigger. We provide a script that that sets up all the. All, uh, sets up all that stuff automatically for you. So I've got that just sitting here in my Vagrant directory. So it's called Configure Remoting for Ansible. That sits in, uh, if, again, if you take a look at our Windows Getting Started guides, it'll point you at this. But if you run this script, this will go ahead and set up that self-signed HTTPS listener and turn on the right protocols and make sure everything is happy. It'll turn off the local, uh, the local account filter stuff uh, so that you can use any local admin account to, to administer this stuff. Um, there's a bunch of things that, like, if you try to just use WinRM quick config, there's still a lot of things that are kind of not quite right for anything but local subnet management using exactly the, uh, you know, using a domain admin account or a local, the local administrator, not some other member of the local admins group. So our script kind of takes care of all that. So by running that now, um, I should be able to go Ansible, Win, and then I tell it with dash I to use the inventory file that we just created called hosts. And then we're going to run the module called win ping. Now, this isn't an ICMP ping. This is an Ansible ping. So this is basically like, go run a really tiny Ansible module on here and just make sure that this system is going to listen and re respond to us uh, for Ansible. So if I did it right, it comes back. And we see for that host, we got a success. And we got a value called uh, pong that came back. And uh, we see that it marked changed false because ping didn't make any changes to the system. All Ansible modules will return you a value that says whether they changed something or not. And if you're running Ansible in check mode, it will tell you whether it would have changed something or not. So that's the basics to getting an Ansible, 
getting Ansible up and running and talking to a Windows machine. It's not too scary so far, and, and uh, you know you can see it happens in it takes a couple minutes, so not not a lot of not a lot of work there. So the next thing people tend to hate about uh, Windows, or we hear a lot of gripes about PowerShell. So for us, it, it made a lot of sense to use PowerShell instead of Python to do this. There were some people when Ansible was really in the really early days that people really wanted to do Windows management, so they went and installed SigWin on all these all these Windows machines and were trying to adapt the existing Ansible Python modules to do that. And when we started looking at like how do we want to do this and kind of do first class support, PowerShell just made a lot more sense because it's already there in like every modern version of Windows that we wanted to support. Plus, we've got the full capabilities of .NET available to us, which is a lot more um, robust than Python when you're dealing with stuff on Windows. So our minimum requirements are PowerShell 3 or higher on Windows 7 or Server 2008. Um, the, we've, people have asked us about PowerShell 2 support and like, hey, I really want to do this Server 2003 thing, and we're just like, nope. It's just the PowerShell 3 is, is really the sweet spot for us and kind of the minimum feature you know, viable feature set that we wanted to do. And uh, as time has gone on and, and other PowerShell versions have come out, we, we definitely feel like we made the right call on that one. Um, the other thing that's great about PowerShell is it gives us access to the entire DSC universe via the WinDSC module in Ansible. So um, just, uh, you know, there, if you're familiar with DSC, like we can, we can call any DSC resource pretty much just uh, transparently through, like it looks just like a normal Ansible task, except we're, call, we're just passing it through. Now, the, the resource has to be installed on the remote target, so unlike you know, with our modules where we push them over from the controller, the DSC resource has to be installed on the target. So like, if you look at this thing here, this is, this is a little, these are three Ansible tasks here that are, that are gonna stand up a DNS server and create a zone and then create a record. Um, so the, if you, I, have a, I have a bigger sample sitting around somewhere that's got this like with all of the, the other Ansible stuff in it to turn on the Windows features and everything. But the important one here is that we're using the WinPS module, module to uh, install the XDNS server DSC module on the target. And then we're going to use our WinDSC module to drive that and pass desired state for it. So again, these are idempotent. They work just exactly the same way as they would under DSC as, as well as kind of Ansible itself. So the next pain point on, on Windows, of course, as we've heard many times today, app installation and maintenance. So uh, WinChocolatey is the uh, Ansible module that takes care of that, and it makes life a whole lot easier um, than you know to give you that that package management experience on Windows. Like if you're trying to do if you're trying to do idempotent system management, you really need a package manager to make that work right. So in cases where WinChocolatey doesn't work for some reason, if you're too lazy to put together a package or something, you just need to run an EXE or an MSI or something, we also have a Win package module that takes care of that as well. Also tries to be idempotent as much as it can. It will check, um, it will check uh, product codes and some other things like that, depending on what you've put in there. So if it's an MSI, we can automatically extract the product code from it. But if it's a, um, if it's an exe, a setup.exe kind of thing, then you have to supply that yourself in order for it to be idempotent properly to be able to say like, oh, it looks like this is already installed. And you can't do anything on Windows without rebooting, right? So <laughs> um, rebooting is really, really painful in general, but especially when you're talking about push mode management, right? Like if I if I'm like if I install a package and the thing reboots out from underneath me, like did the package install right? Did I get my result back? Like I don't know what happened. I just got dead air on the other end of the thing. So uh, after seeing a lot of pain, both on the Linux and the Windows side, but especially on the Windows side, um, we built the Win Reboot action. Uh, which kind of, it's, it's a special kind of plugin for Ansible that, that runs on the controller, and we can, we can basically uh, wrap up a, a lot more logic in there than, than when we're just running something directly on the target. So we can run lots of different things on the target, and we can directly connect, talk to the connection layers to see what's going on, and, and just to see, basically, like, when you run the re win reboot action, the, the machine reboots, and basically the playbook execution just pauses until the machine comes back. And so we'll go out there and sample it quickly and make sure, that, and then we'll, we'll also make sure that the management stuff is back up and running and that it's actually able to run Ansible modules again before we can return. So uh, it makes those managed reboots really trivial. And then we actually ended up splitting out half of that into an, another module or another action called wait for connection. It's just the second half of that so that it does, like if you're bringing up a cloud host or something, 
you can bring up, you know, in, in your Ansible playbook, you can do whatever stuff you're going to do to bring up that cloud host. And then we can say, like, hey, just hang out and wait until we can actually talk to and manage all these hosts before we move on with our playbook execution. So again, that linear execution st uh, style makes that really easy to pull off uh, compared to if you're doing kind of the thundering herd pull mode and, and uh, you might have things if you're trying to do any kind of orchestration, especially like I want to get this thing, you know, I want to get these things all up to a particular level before I start putting them into into service on a load balancer, things like that. Another big pain point is Windows Update. So the way Ansible deals with Windows Update is we have a module called Win Updates, and it just does really basic synchronous updates. So. When I was a Windows admin, uh, when, I, when I was responsible for big Windows infrastructure, it was just, it was always a pain. Like, even, no matter what we did, we had SCCM, we had some other things, but you know what, like, during maintenance windows, we still couldn't rely on it to actually update the stuff synchronously in time, or sometimes the agent just didn't work, whatever it was. We'd still end up during maintenance windows, remote desktoping into machines and, like, you know, clicking buttons. And that sucks. So. Win updates really tries uh, very hard to use the again using the technologies that are there. So whatever your configured update source is, it's going to use WSUS if your machines are configured that way. It'll use public Windows update if not. Um, it's going to go out, use those things, so uh, and and just automatically install whatever's there, and then it will also automatically reboot the machine as many times as necessary and continue applying updates until you've reached a fully patched state. So those are all options and kind of knobs that you can turn on that. Uh, but like, so here's just a really simple example. We're going to call win updates. We're going to say, I want to just install things from the critical updates category. You could pass a list of things to it. If you do the reboot, yes, then it will just say like, go ahead and reboot the host as many times as you need to, but you know, don't come back until this thing is completely patched. Um, and then you can also, we also have whitelist and blacklist uh, capabilities there. So if you have specific KBs that you want to make sure, you know, that, that you know aren't safe. And same thing on the whitelist side. If you just want to say like, there's just these three things that I want, you can filter those things the same way. So IIS, obviously, you know, the web server everybody loves to hate. Um, it, uh, <laughs> it's gotten a lot better since, you know, IIS 4 days. But uh, <clears throat> so Ansible has some really basic modules in the box for managing websites, web apps, app pools, virtual directories, some of that stuff. And we'll see those in action here uh, in just a little bit. So here's just a couple of samples, though. Like, you know, if we're just recreating the default website that, that comes with it, then we're going to, you know, create it in the ECI NetPub triple dub root physical path, and then same thing, we want, to create the, uh, we want to create an Orchard CMS web app in a particular place um, under the default website, then that's, that's a module to do that too. Uh, the registry, again, something unique to Windows uh, that, that's much maligned and, and hated by uh, uh, Linux folks, but it's, uh, you know, uh, we have modules for dealing with that as well, so it's just uh, individual key value pairs uh, management using the WinRegEdit module. Um, and then we can also do the idempotent bulk import. So if you've got a templated reg file or something that you spit out of another machine that you want to import somewhere else, we also have WinReg merge that can take care of that idempotently as well. So again, just a couple of samples here. You know, setting, just setting a key value pair and, and setting that complex uh, registry data. So Windows services, um, again, kind of a unique problem to Windows and, and a, a real pain point for automation still, it feels like. Um, you know, the Microsoft's, the, like the PowerShell, the PowerShell support for services is kind of, it's incomplete, it's been growing, it's been getting better, but there are still things that you can't set in there. So we've tried to be pretty exhaustive in, in the things that you can set. Uh, with the Ansible Win Service module, so you can do all the typical like who, what, when, where, how, like all the you know delayed start and like and, you know re uh, compensating recovery actions, all the kinds of things that you need to be able to do, um, you you can do with the Win Service module. It gives us that fine grained control that that you need, as well as just still the basic start and stop things. So you know again, just a couple samples here. If we want to make sure IIS is running, we just say W3SVC state running. And if we want to make sure that the firewall service is stopped, MPS service stopped, and then we can also set start mode disabled, and then it's next time the thing boots. Domains are another unique Windows problem. Uh, it's uh, Windows's way of doing enterprise identity and uh, of doing shared login stuff. Uh, it makes authentication a little more complicated. Uh, it, it only in the last year or so has Ansible finally been able to run the entire, you know, where we're actually able to use all of the different options for the auth types that are available with NTLM, CredSSP, Kerberos, BASIC, all of those things. Um, 
One of the things that's kind of cool that Ansible can do, and this is something that I would have killed for when I, uh, when I was running a software stack that was built on Windows, uh, a large software stack. Uh, Ansible can build throwaway domains really easily. We can do it in a single task, win domain. Tell us the name of the domain, give us a password, like that's it. We can create a domain with one task. It's really nice for CI pipelines and stuff where you're, you know, when I was doing this before, we had kind of a golden, we had, we had like a test domain controller that we had that, that sat there and we'd have to go in and like clear things out every once in a while because, you know, after a few hundred jobs or whatever, the things would just kind of start piling up in there with all these ephemeral machines coming and going. Um, it's really nice to just have something where you can just be like, just spin me up a new domain from scratch, use it, set it up, and then throw the whole thing away when you're done with it. Uh, Ansible can also really easily promote and depromote DCs. Um, we can join and leave uh, work, uh, work groups and domains really easily uh, with on the works on the member server side. And then we're also starting to add capabilities for doing basic management of domain objects. So, you know, users, groups, computer accounts, OUs, those kinds of things. So that stuff is continuing to grow as people are asking for it. So again, a couple of really simple samples here. Uh, creating a domain. So for creating a domain from scratch, all we have to do is tell it what's the DNS domain name. And if that machine, if, if there isn't one that, that's like that, we're gonna make the machine you're talking to right now, the new forest root and domain controller for that thing. And then we just have to give it a safe mode password. And then we're you know, creating a domain user, just giving it the UPN format, telling it the list of groups we want it to be in. Very simple, very declarative, very human readable. So let's see. I can just demo that real quick here. So if I take a look at... Here is a really simple playbook. You guys haven't seen a playbook yet, but this is it. So, Let's just take a look at what's in here. So the first thing, this is, it's a YAML document and it's a list of plays and a play is a list of tasks that target um, a particular set of inventory hosts or groups. So in this case, we're targeting that win group that we created earlier. We've turned off fact gathering just because we don't need it. Uh, we, we, we're not needing it in this case. So what I'm doing is taking my Windows machine and saying like, hey, set the DNS client to use the domain controller because that's, uh, that's what's set up in here. And then because I don't, you know, I don't have DHCP set up on that particular subnet. And then the, big, the, the one that's actually doing the work here is the Win Domain membership module. So again, we're telling it what's the DNS domain name of the, the domain we wanna join. And we have, um, we have the ability to reset the host name as well. So I'm gonna change the host name. We'll just call it WinOps3 just for fun. Um, I've got my domain admin user and password in plain text in here again. So, you know, good, good security practice there. And uh, I've said that I want, it to be, I want it to be a domain member. So I could also set this to state work group and then it would join, it would kick me out of there and it would kick me out of the domain if I was already in it. And then the thing that I'm doing here is registering the output of this task. So it says, I wanna do something with the output from this task. And the thing I wanna do with it is in the next task here, I say, I wanna reboot this host, but I only wanna do it if the output says that I need a reboot. So if we go look at the docs for the Win Domain membership module, that's one of the things that it'll return to us. So all I need to do then, so remember I said there's two entry points into Ansible. We're gonna use the other one now. This is the one that most people are using most of the time, um, and that's Ansible Playbook. So again, we're gonna use our, um, we're gonna use that inventory file we created earlier and join the domain. So there's something else I wanna kick off here in a second. Um, so you can see our WinDNS client came back and said it was changed because we were talking to a different DNS server. Our domain membership came back saying it was changed because we joined the domain when we weren't on it before. And then now we're rebooting. So our, our play is sitting here waiting until it comes back from the reboot. Um, and that'll take a second. But the cool thing about this is like, you know, if this had, let's say this crapped out somewhere in the middle or that we had some other, you know, we got a connectivity problem or something, we don't have to worry about what state we were in before. We just run the thing again and it'll pick it right up and pick up where we left off. So if I run this again now, it'll come back a lot faster and they'll all come back as green because, okay, my WinDNS client was already in the right state, the domain membership was already in the right state and we skipped the reboot because why would we reboot if we didn't, we don't need to. So. That's, uh, that's kind of the basics there. All right.
Okay, so ACLs again, um, this is uh, just another pain point that people, try to, that people have to deal with. Uh, so we provide the win ACL and win owner modules that will take care of all that stuff. How many in here have ever written SDDL? I'm sorry. The, uh, so like, this is not human readable. So uh, this, is, uh, this is our take on it. So uh, this, is, this is the way you would do it if you're using Ansible. Um, I, I think that's just a little more readable uh, than, than what's going on uh, in that other stuff. So uh, let's, do, let's do one other thing here. I will kick this off. Um, actually, I don't know if we're gonna have time for this, so maybe I won't kick this off. But uh, just know that what I was gonna show you is an Ansible role that uh, will install a Chocolatey Simple server. So if you look at chocolate, like the Chocolatey Simple server, the binaries live out on Chocolatey, uh, you know, is in Chocolatey, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff you have to do. You have to set up IIS, you have to set up your app pool, you have to do a whole bunch of different things. So we, uh, we wrapped that stuff up into an Ansible role. One of my colleagues uh, uh, took this on just kind of as a fun little project, and he, ended, he published it out there. So actually, if you, look at the, if you look at the Chocolatey docs on that, they'll point you to this Ansible role that can set this stuff up. Uh, but I'm going to skip that demo for now because we are short on time. So with that, I promised you a poem. So uh, I, the, this, is, this is my version of Kat's poem to Patrick at the end of the movie. I hate using WinRM in the shell that you call power. I hate the way you install your apps. Windows Update makes me glower. I hate the way you must reboot and your web server IIS. I hate your complex registry. It always is a mess. I hate your janky services and your stupid domain auth, and managing your ACLs are sure to leave me wroth. I hate automating you. I hate that I have to learn you at all. But with Ansible on my tool belt, I don't hate you. Not even close, not even a little bit, not even at all. <laughs> so, like, what? Any questions, or are you guys uh, ready to go get lunch? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's already in there, actually. Uh, so if you take a look at, uh, I think it came in 2.7, which just shipped uh, like last week. So yeah, if you take a look at that, there is uh, Win Chocolatey Config, Win Chocolatey Source, and uh, yeah, Win Chocolatey Sources, and I think one other one. So oh, uh, Win Chocolatey Feature. So if you want to do like, if you want to plug in license code, you want to do like you just kind of feature management stuff on the Chocolatey endpoints, like you can do that now. So the, the question was whether uh, for you know typical like Ansible authentication, um, yeah. I if you're using the open source, if you're just using the open source command line stuff, I would strongly recommend Ansible Vault. But we also actually integrate with a bunch of different password managers and things, so that you can do lookups with like CyberArk and um, uh, LastPass. I think there's there's a few other things where you, we have lookup plugins where you can actually go pull those credentials right out of there and just plug those into your inventory that way too. So lots of options there. And of course, you're, if you're using Tower, you can lock them up in the database um, the way we do. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I couldn't catch the last part. Do you have to do something specific on your defense box in order to enable the RM or something like that? It, it depends on the version. So the question was if we had to do anything special uh, to enable the WinRM endpoints. And so it depends on your Windows version. The older the Windows version, the more you have to do. So, uh, but on, on newer Windows versions, like if, you're, if your Ansible controller is available, is on the same subnet as your Windows host, you're good to go. Like me, me, using, if you want to use message encrypted HTTP, which we support, um, then yeah, you're, you're good to go. You can, just, you can just reach out and talk to it. And uh, the, the one thing you may have to do, depending again, is that like the local account filter, uh, token filter stuff, you may have to turn off if you want to use some other local admin account other than like, you know, administrator. Uh, there's there's some there's some weird rules about that and but if you're using like domain admin accounts or something like yeah it's good to go. Uh, so a couple there yeah. Targeting the inventory. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 
Yes, absolutely. Like the inventory is very flexible. So that, that would be a case depending on what, what you're talking about. If you're talking about like server assigned pa or you know, like generated passwords or something like that, usually there's a mechanism to get it. So like for AWS, there, we actually have a module that can go look up the passwords. There's lookup plugins that can do that stuff dynamically. You can do it with dynamic inventory as well. So there's, there's lots of different ways that you can kind of slice and dice that stuff depending on where your credentials are coming from. So yeah, this was, this was just the simple flat example. But yes, you can, you can get really wacky with it if you want to and, and like override that stuff at the host level either manually or using any of the dynamic inventory techniques that are available. Yeah? So with Vault of Passwords, is there any support coming into pushing Vault of Passwords to be able to assign that to some source script? It's like one problem with like Python that you need some source script to have access to other ways, but to have access to Vault of Passwords. So yes, uh, in fact, there's a thing that's actually been around in the last few releases of Ansible, but it's, it's kind of been evolving. It's called inventory plugins. So that makes, uh, that makes the inventory, uh, the dynamic inventory stuff kind of a first class thing. So you can share code with other, you can sh it, it runs inside the Ansible controller as opposed to the inventory scripts, which are just kind of completely standalone and just spit j JSON on standard out. Uh, with the inventory plugins, it's like, a, it's like a first class citizen inside of Ansible. So it has access to like, for instance, the vault reader. So by default, we assume that anything that that thing reads in, it, it gets run through the vault reader automatically. So if you've already set up a vaulted password, uh, on the vaulted password stuff, you just kind of get it for free. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'll be around, uh, I'll be around for the rest of the day. So if you want to stop me in the hallway or whatever, I, I'd love to chat with you. Thanks.